Part two of Cosmos, a sketch of the physical description of the universe, introduction, by Alexander von Humboldt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Introduction Reflections on the different degrees of enjoyment presented to us by the aspect of nature and the study of her laws. In attempting, after a long absence from my native country, to develop the physical phenomena of the globe and the simultaneous action of the forces that pervade the regions of space, I experience a twofold cause of anxiety. The subject before me is so inexhaustible and so varied that I fear either to fall into the superficiality of the encyclopedist or to weary the mind of my reader by aphorisms consisting of mere generalities clothed in dry and dogmatical forms. Undue conciseness often checks the flow of expression, while diffuseness is alike detrimental to a clear and precise exposition of our ideas nature is a free domain and the profound conceptions and enjoyments she awakens within us can only be vividly delineated by thought clothed in exalted forms of speech worthy of bearing witness to the majesty and greatness of the creation in considering the study of physical phenomena not merely in its bearings on the material wants of life but in its general influence on the intellectual advancement of mankind we find its noblest and most important result to be a knowledge of the chain of connections by which all natural forces are linked together and made mutually dependent upon each other and it is the perception of these relations that exalts our views and ennobles our enjoyments such a result can however only be reaped as the fruit of observation and intellect combined with the spirit of the age in which are reflected all the varied phases of thought he who can trace through bygone times the stream of our knowledge to its primitive source will learn from history how for thousands of years man has labored amid the ever-recurring changes of form to recognize the invariability of natural laws and has thus by the force of mind gradually subdued a great portion of the physical world to his dominion in interrogating the history of the past we trace the mysterious course of ideas yielding the first glimmering perception of the same image of a cosmos or harmoniously ordered whole which dimly shadowed forth to the human mind in the primitive ages of the world is now fully revealed to the maturer intellect of mankind as the result of long and laborious observation each of these epochs of the contemplation of the external world the earliest dawn of thought and the advanced stage of civilization has its own source of enjoyment in the former this enjoyment in accordance with the simplicity of the primitive ages flowed from an intuitive feeling of the order that was proclaimed by the invariable and successive reappearance of the heavenly bodies and by the progressive development of organized beings while in the latter this sense of enjoyment springs from a definite knowledge of the phenomena of nature when man began to interrogate nature and not content with observing learned to evoke phenomena under definite conditions when once he sought to collect and record facts in order that the fruit of his labors might aid investigation after his own brief existence had passed away the philosophy of nature cast aside the vague and poetic garb in which she had been enveloped from her origin and having assumed a severer aspect she now now weighs the value of observations and substitutes induction and reasoning for conjecture and assumption the dogmas of former ages survive now only in the superstitions of the people and the prejudices of the ignorant or are perpetuated in a few systems which conscious of their weakness shroud themselves in a veil of mystery we may also trace the same primitive intuitions in languages exuberant in figurative expressions and a few of the best chosen symbols engendered by the happy inspiration of the earliest ages having by degrees lost their vagueness through a better mode of interpretation are still preserved among our scientific terms nature considered rationally that is to say submitted to the process of thought is a unity in diversity of phenomena 
a harmony blending together all created things however dissimilar in form and attributes one great whole topan animated by the breath of life the most important result of a rational inquiry into nature is therefore to establish the unity and harmony of this stupendous mass of force and matter to determine with impartial justice what is due to the discoveries of the past and to those of the present and to analyze the individual parts of natural phenomena without succumbing beneath the weight of the whole thus and thus alone is it permitted to man while mindful of the high destiny of his race to comprehend nature to lift the veil that shrouds her phenomena and as it were submit the results of observation to the test of reason and intellect in reflecting upon the different degrees of enjoyment presented to us in the contemplation of nature we find that the first place must be assigned to a sensation which is wholly independent of an intimate acquaintance with the physical phenomena presented to our view or of the peculiar character of the region surrounding us in the uniform plain bounded only by a distant horizon where the lowly heather the cistus or waving grasses deck the soil on the ocean shore where the waves softly rippling over the beach leave a track green with the weeds of the sea everywhere the mind is penetrated by the same sense of the grandeur and vast expanse of nature revealing to the soul by a mysterious inspiration the existence of laws that regulate the forces of the universe mere communion with nature mere contact with the free air exercise a soothing yet strengthening influence on the wearied spirit calm the storm of passion and soften the heart when shaken by sorrow to its inmost depths everywhere in every region of the globe in every stage of intellectual culture the same sources of enjoyment are alike vouchsafed to man the earnest and solemn thoughts awakened by a communion with nature intuitively arise from a presentiment of the order and harmony pervading the whole universe and from the contrast we draw between the narrow limits of our own existence and the image of infinity revealed on every side whether we look upward to the starry vault of heaven scan the far-stretching plain before us or seek to trace the dim horizon across the vast expanse of ocean the contemplation of the individual characteristics of the landscape and of the conformation of the land in any definite region of the earth gives rise to a different source of enjoyment awakening impressions that are more vivid better defined and more congenial to certain phases of the mind than those of which we have already spoken at one time the heart is stirred by a sense of the grandeur of the face of nature by the strife of the elements or as in northern asia by the aspect of the dreary barrenness of the far-stretching steppes at another time softer emotions are excited by the contemplation of rich harvests wrested by the hand of man from the wild fertility of nature or by the sight of human habitations raised beside some wild and foaming torrent here i regard less the degree of intensity than the difference existing in the various sensations that derive their charm and permanence from the peculiar character of the scene if i might be allowed to abandon myself to the recollections of my own distant travels i would instance among the most striking scenes of nature the calm sublimity of a tropical night when the stars not sparkling as in our northern skies shed their soft and planetary light over the gently heaving ocean or i would recall the deep valleys of the corderillas where the tall and slender palms pierce the leafy veil around them and waving on high their feathery and arrow-like branches form as it were a forest above a forest or i would describe the summit of the peak of teneriffe when a horizontal layer of clouds dazzling in whiteness has separated the cone of cinders from the plain below and suddenly the ascending current pierces the cloudy veil so that the eye of the traveller may range from the brink of the crater along the vine-clad slopes of oratava to the orange gardens and banana groves that skirt the shore 
in scenes like these it is not the peaceful charm uniformly spread over the face of nature that moves the heart but rather the peculiar physiognomy and conformation of the land the features of the landscape the ever varying outline of the clouds and their blending with the horizon of the sea whether it lies spread before us like a smooth and shining mirror or is dimly seen through the morning mist all that the senses can but imperfectly comprehend all that is most awful in such romantic scenes of nature may become a source of enjoyment to man by opening a wide field to the creative powers of his imagination impressions change with the varying movements of the mind and we are led by a happy illusion to believe that we receive from the external world that with which we have ourselves invested it when far from our native country after a long voyage we tread for the first time the soil of a tropical land we experience a certain feeling of surprise and gratification in recognizing in the rocks that surround us the same inclined schistostrata and the same columnar basalt covered with cellular amygdaloids that we had left in europe and whose identity of character in latitudes so widely different reminds us that the solidification of the earth's crust is altogether independent of climatic influences but these rocky masses of schist and of basalt are covered with vegetation of a character with which we are unacquainted and of a physiognomy wholly unknown to us and it is then amid the colossal and majestic forms of an exotic flora that we feel how wonderfully the flexibility of our nature fits us to receive new impressions linked together by a certain secret analogy we so readily perceive the affinity existing among all the forms of organic life that although the sight of a vegetation similar to that of our native country might at first be most welcome to the eye as the sweet familiar sounds of our mother tongue are to the ear we nevertheless by degrees and almost imperceptibly become familiarized with a new home and a new climate as a true citizen of the world man everywhere habituates himself to that which surrounds him yet fearful as it were of breaking the links of association that bind him to the home of his childhood the colonist applies to some few plants in a far distant clime the names he had been familiar with in his native land and by the mysterious relations existing among all types of organization the forms of exotic vegetation present themselves to his mind as nobler and more perfect developments of those he had loved in earlier days thus do the spontaneous impressions of the untutored mind lead like the laborious deductions of cultivated intellect to the same intimate persuasion that one sole and indissoluble chain binds together all nature it may seem a rash attempt to endeavor to separate into its different elements the magic power exercised upon our minds by the physical world since the character of the landscape and of every imposing scene in nature depends so materially upon the mutual relation of the ideas and sentiments simultaneously excited in the mind of the observer the powerful effect exercised by nature springs as it were from the connection and unity of the impressions and emotions produced and we can only trace their different sources by analyzing the individuality of objects and the diversity of forces the richest and most varied elements for pursuing an analysis of this nature present themselves to the eyes of the traveller in the scenery of southern asia in the great indian archipelago and more especially too in the new continent where the summits of the lofty corderias penetrate the confines of the aerial ocean surrounding our globe and where the same subterranean forces that once raised these mountain chains still shake them to their foundation and threaten their downfall graphic delineations of nature arranged according to systematic views are not only suited to please the imagination but may also when properly considered indicate the grades of the impressions of which i have spoken from the uniformity of the seashore or the barren steppes of siberia to the inexhaustible fertility of the torrid zone 
if we were even to picture to ourselves mount pilatus placed on the schreckhorn or the schneekop of silesia on mont blanc we should not have attained to the height of that great colossus of the andes the Kimborazo, whose height is twice that of mount etna and we must pile the rigi or mount athos on the summit of the chimborazo in order to form a just estimate of the elevation of the dawalajiri the highest point of the himalaya but although the mountains of india greatly surpass the cordillas of south america by their astonishing elevation which after being long contested has at last been confirmed by accurate measurements they cannot from their geographical position present the same inexhaustible variety of phenomena by which the latter are characterized the impression produced by the grander aspects of nature does not depend exclusively on height the chain of the himalaya is placed far beyond the limits of the torrid zone and scarcely is a solitary palm tree to be found in the beautiful valleys of Kamun and jarwal on the southern slope of the ancient paropamesis in the latitudes of twenty eight degrees and thirty four degrees nature no longer displays the same abundance of tree ferns and arborescent grasses heliconias and orchidaceous plants which in tropical regions are to be found even on the highest plateau of the mountains on the slope of the himalayas under the shade of the deodora and the broad-leaved oak peculiar to these indian alps the rocks of granite and of mica schist are covered with vegetable forms almost similar to those which characterize europe and northern asia the species are not identical but closely analogous in aspect and physiognomy as for instance the juniper the alpine birch the gentian the marsh parnassia and the prickly species of ribs the chain of the himalaya is also wanting in the imposing phenomena of volcanoes which in the andes and in the indian archipelago often reveal to the inhabitants under the most terrific forms the existence of the forces pervading the interior of our planet moreover on the southern declivity of the himalaya where the ascending current deposits the exhalations rising from a vigorous indian vegetation the region of perpetual snow begins at an elevation of eleven thousand or twelve thousand feet above the level of the sea thus setting a limit to the development of organic life in a zone that is nearly three thousand feet lower than that to which it attains in the equinoctial region of the corderias but the countries bordering on the equator possess another advantage to which sufficient attention has not hitherto been directed this portion of the surface of the globe affords in the smallest space the greatest possible variety of impressions from the contemplation of nature among the colossal mountains of the cundinamarca of quito and of peru furrowed by deep ravines man is enabled to contemplate alike all the families of plants and all the stars of the firmament there at a single glance the eye surveys majestic palms humid forests of bambusa and the varied species of musasia while above these forms of tropical vegetation appear oaks medlars the sweet briar and umbelliferous plants as in our european homes there as the traveller turns his eyes to the vault of heaven a single glance embraces the constellation of the southern cross the magellanic clouds and the guiding stars of the constellation of the bear as they circle round the arctic pole there the depths of the earth and the vaults of heaven display all the richness of their forms and the variety of their phenomena there the different climates are ranged the one above the other stage by stage like the vegetable zones whose succession they limit and there the observer may readily trace the laws that regulate the diminution of heat as they stand indelibly inscribed on the rocky walls and abrupt declivities of the corderias not to weary the reader with the details of the phenomena which i long since endeavoured graphically to represent i will here limit myself to the consideration of a few of the general results whose combinations constitutes the physical delineation of the torrid zone 
that which in the vagueness of our impressions loses all distinctness of form like some distant mountain shrouded from view by a veil of mist is clearly revealed by the light of mind which by its scrutiny into the causes of phenomena learns to resolve and analyze their different elements assigning to each its individual character thus in the sphere of natural investigation as in poetry and painting the delineation of that which appeals most strongly to the imagination derives its collective interest from the vivid truthfulness with which the individual features are portrayed the regions of the torrid zone not only give rise to the most powerful impressions by their organic richness and their abundant fertility but they likewise afford the inestimable advantage of revealing to man by the uniformity of the variations of the atmosphere and the development of vital forces and by the contrasts of climate and vegetation exhibited at different elevations the invariability of the laws that regulate the course of the heavenly bodies reflected as it were in terrestrial phenomena let us dwell then for a few moments on the proofs of this regularity which is such that it may be submitted to numerical calculation and computation in the burning plains that rise but little above the level of the sea reign the families of the bananas the cycas and the palm of which the number of species comprised in the flora of tropical regions has been so wonderfully increased in the present day by the zeal of botanical travellers to these groups succeed in the alpine valleys and the humid and shaded clefts on the slopes of the corderias the tree ferns whose thick cylindrical trunks and delicate lace-like foliage stand out in bold relief against the azure of the sky and the chintona from which we derive the febrifuge bark the medicinal strength of this bark is said to increase in proportion to the degree of moisture imparted to the foliage of the tree by the light mists which form the upper surface of the clouds resting over the plains everywhere around the confines of the forest are encircled by broad bands of social plants as the delicate aurelia the thimbodia and the myrtle-leaved andromeda while the alpine rose the magnificent betharia weaves a purple girdle round the spiry peaks in the cold regions of the paramos which is continually exposed to the fury of storms and winds we find that flowering shrubs and herbaceous plants bearing large and variegated blossoms have given place to monocotyledons whose slender spikes constitute the sole covering of the soil this is the zone of the grasses one vast savanna extending over the immense mountain plateau and reflecting a yellow almost golden tinge to the slopes of the corderias on which graze the llama and the cattle domesticated by the european colonist where the naked trachyte rock pierces the grassy turf and penetrates into those higher strata of air which are supposed to be less charged with carbonic acid we meet only with plants of an inferior organization as lichens lecidias and the brightly colored dust-like laparia scattered around in circular patches islets of fresh fallen snow varying in form and extent arrest the last feeble traces of vegetable development and to these succeeds the region of perpetual snow whose elevation undergoes but little change and may be easily determined it is but rarely that the elastic forces at work within the interior of our globe have succeeded in breaking through the spiral domes which resplendent in the brightness of eternal snow crown the summits of the corderias and even where these subterranean forces have opened a permanent communication with the atmosphere through circular craters or open fissures they rarely send forth currents of lava but merely eject ignited scoriae steam sulphurated hydrogen gas and jets of carbonic acid End of part two.